Hi, I'm Joe Landry, and this is a presentation about the history of Franklin, decade by decade. In this video, we'll look back at the 1900s and explore the events that happened during that time period. The sources of information that will be discussed in this presentation were taken from such places as the Franklin Register, which was the town's first newspaper, and the Franklin Sentinel, which replaced it. The pictures were taken from the Stanley Chilson collection and the Sanborn fire insurance maps, as well as my own personal pictures and postcards. In addition, I would like to give a special word of thanks to Rebecca Finnegan and the staff at the Franklin Historical Museum for their assistance. The Franklin Historical Museum's website is shown here, where you will find links to Facebook and Instagram. The YMCA in Franklin. This notice appeared in the December 11, 1900 Franklin Sentinel. It stated that the YMCA had been established in Franklin in the new Morse block on East Central Street. Rooms were reserved for reading and other activities. A gymnasium was set up on the fourth floor, complete with rings, trapeze, punching bag, chest weights, and so on. Lockers were also set up for members' clothing. The William Elkerton Bakery In June of 1900, William Elkerton established a bakery in a building on West Central Street that had been owned by Erastus Metcalf. One week after he opened for business, a fire started in a closet in a room above the oven at the rear of the building and spread to beneath the roof. The fire department arrived and extinguished the fire in a short time. The cause of the fire was believed to be spontaneous combustion. The damage was slight though, and a few days later, Mr. Elkerton resumed doing business. The First St. Mary's Catholic Church In June of 1900, the First St. Mary's Catholic Church burnt to the ground. This church had previously been the First Congregational Church. The parochial school on the corner of Union Street and Beaver Street, which had just been constructed, was converted into a church. The James H. Reardon Shoe Repair Shop James H. Reardon established his shoe repair shop in the Exchange Building on Main Street in the early 1900s. In August of 1918, he moved his shop to the room underneath the Franklin National Bank in the first Ray Block. In July of 1920, he moved his shop to this building, which was located next to the Town Bridge on West Central Street. The Albert J. Riley Lunch Car. This notice appeared in the August 7, 1900 edition of the Franklin Sentinel. In August of 1919, George C. Cotton, who had owned the lunch cart near the bridge for a couple of years, sold it to Henry J. Bardall. William Gamble, who had managed the cart at that time, retired. St. John's Episcopal Mission in October of 1900, Lavange Russell, the widow of Aaron Hartwell Morse, sold a plot of land on School Street to the St. John's Episcopal Mission so that they could construct a parish house, a church, and a rectory. In January of 1908, this artist's conception appeared in the Franklin Sentinel, which showed the new church and the buildings that would be constructed. In May of 1908, the cornerstone was laid by the Right Reverend William Lawrence, the Bishop of Massachusetts. In October of 1909, the new St. John's Episcopal Church was dedicated. The Bandstand on the Town Common In July of 1901, the Franklin Band erected a bandstand on the Common so that they could give weekly concerts there. The Ray Science Building at Dean Academy In August of 1901, 
Miss Lydia Payne Ray and Mrs. Annie Ray Thayer donated a sum of money for a new building to be erected at Dean Academy, which would be called the Ray Science Building. This building would be dedicated in memory of their father, Joseph G. Ray, who had died the previous year. The building would contain ample laboratory equipment for teaching physics and chemistry, and it would also contain a museum for the display of minerals. In April of 1903, the new hall in the Ray Science Building was opened, and the Literary Society presented Mr. Bob and A Straw Man with music by the Dean Orchestra. The Ray Memorial Library In March of 1902, work began on the Ray Memorial Library. The library was a gift to the town of Franklin by Miss Lydia P. Ray and Mrs. Annie Ray Thayer in memory of their parents, Mr. Joseph G. Ray and Mrs. Emily Rockwood Ray, both of whom had recently died. The library was formally dedicated in October of 1904. The Alms House. This is the former Alms House on Summer Street, as it appears today. In May of 1902, a warrant for the special town meeting was brought forward regarding a new Alms House. The plan was to utilize the foundation of the existing home with a new extension on the northwest end. A piazza and several entrances would be added to the building, and it would have hospital accommodations. The estimated cost was about $8,000 and $1,000 for furnishings, making a total of $9,000. It opened in December of 1902. In 1949, the property was auctioned off and it then became the Hillcrest Convalescent Home. Today, it is an apartment building. Delivery of Mail to Homes by the Postal Service in May of 1902, W.B. Snow, the governmental post office inspector, arrived in Franklin to begin the process of establishing the delivery and collection of mail to individual homes. Up until that time, residents would have to go to the post office to get their mail. Three letter carriers would be appointed with six collection boxes for each carrier. In August, Postmaster Talbot began to accept applications for the position of letter carrier. The prospective carrier would have to take an exam that covered such things as orthography, penmanship, copying, arithmetic, local delivery, reading addresses, and so on. The exam was open to all citizens of the United States who met the requirements. Applicants needed to be at least five feet, four inches in height and weigh not less than 125 pounds. They had to be between the ages of 18 and 40 years old. The salary was $600, and a bond of $100 had to be given. In September, the three men who were appointed letter carriers were Timothy J. Healy, Bertram A. Turner, and Richard Costello, who was shown here in this 1939 picture. The Soldiers' Monument on the Town Common In July of 1902, Frederick A. Newell of Attleboro proposed a gift of the Soldiers' Monument to the Town of Franklin. In March of 1903, construction began on the Town Common for the new monument. The contract for the foundation was given to Adam Landry, a, a local stonemason who also was my great-grandfather. It was dedicated on Memorial Day of 1903. The Water Tank at the Train Depot In July of 1902, a new water tank was constructed on the opposite side of the tracks from the train depot. It stood 47 feet above the track, and the bottom of the tank was about 24 feet above the track. It was built on a strong cobble foundation with heavy granite blocks immediately beneath the tank, and those blocks are still there to this day. The tank was 24 feet in diameter, with a capacity of 61,500 gallons of water. Continental Nurseries 
In January of 1903, Adrian Van Leeuwen, owner of Continental Nurseries of Worcester, purchased the Joseph G. Ray Farm Estate at the corner of Beaver Street and West Central Street. The plot of land contained about 30 acres. Mr. Van Leeuwen intended to extend his nursery business there. In September of 1922, Matthew J. Van Leeuwen sold 10 acres of land facing Beaver Street and partly on West Central Street and running in the rear of the land he occupied as Continental Nurseries to the Eagle Realty and Development Company of Central Falls for cutting into house lots. The Franklin Courthouse In March of 1903, a hearing took place before the Legislative Judicial Committee in Boston relative to changing of the sittings of the Western Norfolk District Court from Walpole to Franklin. This was proposed in order to save court expenses in the matter of rentals, the transportation of officers and criminals, and for easy access to court records. The court was established in the building at the corner of East Central Street and Cottage Street, as seen in the picture. In the early 1950s, the court was moved to Rentham. The Ray School In September of 1907, the new Ray School was dedicated by Mrs. Annie Ray Thayer, who donated the money that paid for the school. The school was damaged by fire in 1935, but the damage was repaired. It was heavily damaged by fire in the 1980s and was demolished. The Third Ray Block In April of 1907, construction began on the Third Ray Block on Main Street. This block was where the Hotel Windsor and a couple of other small buildings were located. The first floor was originally designed to have five stores at ground level. There would be three large doors and two small ones. The second floor would have 13 rooms for offices. There would be two entrances to the building with stairways leading to the offices. At one point in the design process, the Masons petitioned the Ray family to see if a third floor hall could be added to the building for their use, but it was not approved. In January of 1922, the block was sold to Jacob F. Gebb. In March of 1923, the block was sold to Felix J. Cataldo, who named the block the Felix J. Cataldo Block. The Haywood Property in March of 1907, Harry Haywood purchased the Claflin property across from the town common on Main Street so that he could construct a new house. In October of 1908, the Haywoods moved into their new house as seen in this picture. Over the next few years, he would purchase the Wellington property, the Fitzpatrick property, and the Pond property, thereby gaining control of the entire property bounded by Main Street, Pleasant Street, and Queen Street and the Congregational Church property. In August of 1915, Mr. Haywood erected a six-room bungalow on his Queen Street property that would be used for his staff. In later years, the bungalow would become the home of Miss Louise Thibodeau, a well-known piano teacher in Franklin. As part of the construction project, Mr. Haywood added a sunken garden behind his home. This view is looking towards Pleasant Street. In April of 1910, Mr. Haywood awarded a contract to the Dillon Brothers of Milford to construct an up-to-date private garage at his home. The garage would contain a machine shop, a washroom, and outbuildings for the gasoline tanks. The main structure would contain three wings. The main room would be left open to the roof and would be used to house five automobiles. In one of the wings, there would be accommodations for two horses and three carriages, together with all the fittings which would go with a complete stable. The other wing would contain the repair shop for the autos, toilets, washrooms, and so forth. The architect that drew up the plans 
with Robert Allen Cook of Milford. At some point in time, a large carousel was added that was large enough to accommodate an automobile. This allowed cars to be driven into the carriage house and moved around for parking purposes. It would also make it easy for the car to be driven out of the garage. Here is a recent picture that shows the carousel. In August of 1921, Mrs. Haywood decided that she wanted a different style home. A new mansion was constructed next to the existing home, and this is that home, as taken in a recent photo from Google Earth. When this mansion was completed, the first home was torn down. In the early 1940s, this mansion was put up for auction. In January of 1944, it was taken over by the Benedictine Sisters and would become an orphanage known as the Home of the Holy Child. In the 1950s, it would be used as a convent when the second St. Mary's Parochial School was built on this property. Today, the mansion is a business building known as Hayward Manor. The Purse House This is a drawing of the two Ray houses that were across from Dean Hall on Main Street. The one on the left was the home of James F. Ray, and the one on the right was the home of Joseph G. Ray. In 1903, Arthur and Lydia Purse, who had recently gotten married, took possession of this home upon the death of Lydia's mother, Emily Ray. In 1906, the Purse House was totally redesigned by covering the existing house with new outer walls to give the house a whole new look. The space between the two outer walls made the house cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Unfortunately, it contributed to the building's demise when it caught fire in the 1990s. The fire went up through the space between the walls and the firefighters were unable to fight the fire properly. As a result, they were unable to save the house and it was a total loss. The Lincoln Memorial Boulder on the Town Common In May of 1908, a large boulder was placed on the common with a tablet embedded in it which had the Gettysburg Address on it. The boulder is egg-shaped and is more than six feet high. It weighs about six or seven tons. The E. A. Staples Straw Factory. This is the E. A. Staples Straw Factory on Winter Street, which was completed in May of 1908. And this concludes our presentation. Thanks for watching.